We're here to do our uh, stories and top headlines. We're yeah. joined by Karen Vorderman and the lovely Nick Ferrari, uh, Nick, who's good down to the line today. So let's start with, this is breaking news, Prince Edward is named the Duke of Edinburgh. This morning on his 59th birthday, Prince Edward has been named the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, Buckingham Palace has announced um, it will be the title held for a lifetime. I suppose the symbolism, Carol, of this is, is, is pretty big. It is, it's fantastic, and it's his birthday. Aww. And I think, you know, it's, I, I have met him, the new Duke of Edinburgh, and the uh, Duchess of Edinburgh many times, and they are fantastic. They've done the groundwork, haven't they? They really have. You know, for decades. And they're a very happy couple. They're a very together couple. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that Prince Philip, before his death, said that he wanted oh. Prince Edward to become the Duke of Edinburgh. So they do such fantastic work uh, with young people, which, yeah. of course, I think. And I did go to St James's uh, Palace once as uh, I'm ambassador for the Royal Air Force Air Cadets, and I'm very proud to say that you of all youth organisations, we win the most Duke of Edinburgh Gold Awards. Really? Yes, and he was there presenting uh, What the was award. he like? Was he nice? Yeah, it was wonderful. And so they, they do all of this stuff, and they don't get much publicity, let's be fair. Well, it was well documented, wasn't it, that um, the Queen took a lot of solace and with Sophie after the passing right. of, of the Duke. Yeah. Nick, what's your take on this? Delighted. Absolutely echo what uh, Carol's just said. If your viewers cast their mind back to that beautiful picture of the late Duke of Edinburgh with now the late Queen relaxing and smiling into the cameras, I think it was taken up in Balmoral. It was the Countess of Wessex, Sophie, who took that picture. And that shows the inter intimacy that's between them. But what I think is great are the, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Now, you're in the studio, you're all far too young. I did the Queen Victoria Awards, I'm so old. <laughs> but the Duke of Edinburgh... The, the, Duke, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, which my sons went on, and I know that they yeah. weren't particularly happy when they got up one morning having to camp in the Surrey Hills for the weekend. They're great. They will continue. And absolutely what Carol said. I think along with Anne, Edward are the, they're the unflashy, the unshowy, the, the, the chips off the old block of the unbelievable Prince Philip. So I think it's great news and a happy birthday to the, to the man at the yeah. centre of the story. Happy 59th birthday. I think he looks really good for his age. I, I was surprised you know by that as well. Met. 59. <laughs> they met in the 1980s when she was a secretary at uh, Capital Radio. And that's how they first met. No, I did not yeah. know you see. But you're going to say Tinder that for happen a in <laughs> 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 OK, let's talk about the Sussexes, because apparently Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are now expected to attend the King's coronation in May. It is claimed the palace have been told to start planning for their appearance, such as seating and dining plans. But I was thinking, well, where are they going to stay? Because <laughs> obviously Frogmore's out of the question, isn't it? Um, insiders caution, there has been no word yet whether the couple has formally accepted the King Charles's invitation uh, which their spokesman revealed was recently sent to them in California by email. Now, come on, surely they were go always going to be invited and surely they were always going to accept, right? Wouldn't you, would you agree, Nick? I, um, they need to accept, absolutely. Yes, one would hope they've always got to be invited. Here's, here's my fervent hope that this, Alison, th this can be the moment that they come, they all try and keep yeah. fairly low-key and it is the start of... And we all know, unfortunately, all families have their rifts. It's all part of being in a family. It is the start of some kind of rapprochement that we all start to get it. Now, that is my hope. Whether that is going to happen, it is another matter. But I think it's good. I think they need to come for the love of God. I'm sure King Charles wants to see his grandchildren and give the little girl who's just been christened, yeah. give her a hug. It's only natural. If that is the start, then actually, the second part of good royal news. Well, family is family at the end of the day. I, and I it, totally Sarah? agree, Nick, because, it, you know, it's time now, isn't it, that the rift was healed. Absolutely. It's also, apparently, uh, Archie's fourth birthday on Coronation Oh, is it? Yeah, apparently. Um, I mean, I'm, I have to admit, I'm not particularly interested whether they come or not. Mm -hmm. It's like the press go mental over it, and I think the press are probably more interested than the public, but, you know, that's what we take our guidance from. Um, and they do love to hate them. Uh, but I think just... Come over, have a nice time, be a family. It's, you know, their father's biggest day. Yeah, celebration, yeah. Yes, and, uh, and I hope the sun shines. You just wouldn't want to be the poor person who's just moved into Frogmore, would you? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> just unpacked. <laughs> well, fine. You need well, to, go. to be <laughs> Get out. Yeah. Or, 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 or Dermot, knowing... Um, uh, Megan's penchant for a large hat, the person sat behind her, because I imagine you're not going to see a great deal inside <laughs> <laughs> the actual ceremony. Um, this is an interesting one. I'd be interested to get your take on this, guys. Sats delayed due to the coronation, due to the yeah. additional bank holiday for King Charles III's coronation. The Standards and Testing Agency has announced this morning that the return of key Stage 2 Sats results to schools will be delayed one week 
So that shouldn't make a difference. But school leaders have branded the delay as disappointing and completely avoidable, claiming it will have a negative impact on schools. Are they kicking off, schools. Don't they? Carol? Well, I mean, you know education is my passion. Yeah, exactly. And I don't really see why a delay, you know, one bank holiday means there's a whole week's delay. And it's very... The kids are over-tested, in my view. I wish they didn't have SATs, but they do. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of stress in education. They've been through the pandemic years and there's an awful lot, and it's not the teacher's fault, it's the system. They teach to the test as opposed to teaching a subject. Uh, because they have to. And then, really, you know, come on, civil servants, get it marked, get it out on time so they can enjoy their last week at school. You know, the, I, I just think it's very poor that one day means there's a week's sure. delay. I Nick, don't see the logic. you're nodding. I think you're, you're in agreement. I I'm, I'm delighted to say I'm in total accord again with Cal. She's absolutely right. Look, <laughs> school, schools don't... We are. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Not always school, that way. <laughs> well, we've had our moments, but we'll park that somewhere else. We, um, schools aren't just about learning times tables or how to spell. They also give a child a framework. And in some instances, as Carol rightly references, we've been through the pandemic. Now, I read one comment, oh, a week isn't a long time in a child's education. No, that's absolutely right. But it is giving them the framework. And it is just saying to these people, look, this is exceptional circumstances for people who, in some instances, have had their education disrupted. Just go the extra yard or the extra one so we can stick to the framework and the youngsters see that when you're meant to do something, you do it on that day and that's a good discipline for life. Oh, that's true, yeah, actually. That I never thought true. of it like that. That's yeah, a really good point. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, this it's is a little bit... for Ferrari and on the twin <laughs> ticket. This is, this is the common sense politics we need. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, there we go. This is a little bit of a worrying story. Um, one in three NHS staff would be unhappy to have their relatives treated in the hospital where they work, a survey reveals. Only 64% said they would be happy with the standard of care provided by their health trust if their relative needed treatment. I mean, this is really worrying, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, basically, can we trust the NHS to give decent care, Carol? Well, I... I, I... You know, I've only just seen this and uh, I was quite shocked by it. Me too. Really shocked. Um, also, 55%, about half, uh, said they do have the, me the materials and equipment needed to do their job and therefore, you know, the other half said that, that more or less the other half said the that they didn't. It's, it's more and, about materials and equipment, isn't it, than the standard? Well, I and don't no know. I think they're also very tired. Of course. You yeah. know, these people have been through a trauma and then... You know, we've had the strikes, which some may disagree with um, or, or not, but it, it's just that they've been through a trauma. They're exhausted. They're on their knees. Mm. And, you know, um, they were saying that, you know, for a lot of them, uh, the system and the tiredness is preventing them from doing their job properly. So the question, can we trust the NHS to give decent care? I think it's for those people to give the answer uh, rather than me. I think, you know... it. They're worn down, the system is worn down, and that's from successive governments, but particularly in the pandemic and particularly the last years. I don't really know where we go from here, to be honest. Um, Nick, uh, it's about four out of ten employees say that it's due to low staffing levels. Um, I mean, what, what could we do to improve that in general? Well, obviously, employ more staff, but I think, as a journalist, I, I want to know a little bit more about this, because I just quote, the, the standard of care provided by the Health Trust. Now, they talk about low staffing levels, and then they also talk about near misses or incidents that could have hurt patients. Now, if we talk about care in the hold, and I am not being dismissive for a moment, I wonder if we're talking about the catering, which in some instances is perhaps not up to the as might as good as it could possibly be in other aspects. Because I have to say that I've actually recently just come from visiting my partner's son who was hospitalised for more than two weeks after a horrific rugby injury. He was at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading. And I'm telling you now, it was absolutely exemplary. From the first person you meet to the nurses to the consultants, they were absolutely fantastic. So I hear what you say, These and I saw them. They are working a hell of a shift. What I saw, you could not improve. But to your point, Alison, yes, of course, more staff is going to improve things. But let's just let's just remember this word is care. So it might not just be doctors, consultants, anaesthetists. It might be as well crucial people, 
crucial people who clean the floors, make the beds and make the food. I think that's the whole package yeah. we need to look at. Sure thing. Yeah, I definitely need to say, as a caveat, my niece is in hospital right yeah. now. I've been going back and forward. Um, she's doing really well, by the way. Good. But the NHS staff have yeah. been so absolutely right? amazing. So, yes, this story it's is humbling, worrying. It's humbling, isn't it? But it's also... Yeah. When, when we, you're with them, it's yeah, absolutely humbling. She has been treated absolutely amazingly. Yes. Hi, Jasmine. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs>